What's the best shotgun? Well, that's a question that I see asked all over the hunting groups on social media. And it's a question that I'm asked all the time too. But the best shotgun for me isn't necessarily the best one for you. So what shotgun do you hunt with? Let me know down in the comments. And if you're looking to buy a shotgun right now, let me know which ones you're looking at. And watch this video to help you discover your best shotgun choice. There's a ton packed into today's video with a few surprises. I'm Joel Strickland, and the first part of my shotgun series begins right now. Now the first shotgun I bought with my own money was a Remington 870 12 gauge. That was in about 1988. Now this is the gun right here. Now it's been used and abused, as you can tell. Now over the years, I've shot several other shotguns, but nothing has beaten the reliability of my old 870, which is why I keep going back to it. However, as I've gotten older, I just don't want to deal with the recoil. So in 2019, I decided that it was time to look for something new and retired this old rusty gun. And so for a year, with the help of a friend who had a gun shop, I tried out a bunch of different shotguns, looking for the perfect gun. Perfect for me. I wanted less recoil, so an autoloader was what I was after. I shot and hunted with many of the popular guns. I didn't like the Benelli Super Black Eagle, or the Mossberg 935. The Browning Maxis wasn't for me. And the A5 almost made the cut, but I had just a few too many issues with its cycling. I landed on the Winchester SX4. Great fit, shoots well, and decently priced. Over the past duck season and a half, it hasn't let me down. I chose the SX4 because it was the right gun for me, but it doesn't mean that it's the perfect gun for you or that other guns that I didn't choose aren't good. This video is to help you figure out that for yourself. I learned so much in my search for the right gun, and I never realized how much I didn't know. I dug deeper into the ammo and choke side as well. And with every answered question came another question for me. Then when I look at social media, I see all of the many questions that a lot of you are asking. And so I decided to put together a comprehensive series on shotguns, choke tubes, and ammunition for waterfowl hunting. Now over the last two years, I've shot 10 different shotguns, a few thousand rounds of like 28 different loads, and choke tubes from eight different manufacturers. On this multiple video series, I'm gonna be answering your questions and covering topics like the differences between steel, bismuth, and tungsten, the shot string, duplex and stack loads, are three and a half inch shells better, sub gauges, and performance differences between all the different brands of choke tubes. Now throughout the process of creating this series, I've interviewed many professionals in the shotgunning world. And in my testing, we've employed technology that's enabled me to show you things that we've never been able to show before and nobody's seen anywhere. Go ahead. I know you want to rewind and watch that again. I'll wait for you. Here's another cool shot. Pellets hitting ballistic gel in super slow motion. That's just a tiny peek at what's to come. I've been an avid duck hunter for over 35 years, and I've learned so much through this process. I'm really excited to bring you this series, and I know it's gonna help you, whether you're new to the sport or a seasoned hunter. Shotgunning is you, the shooter, combining skills with your firearm, choke tube, and ammunition to effectively and ethically harvest game. The whole process itself involves trade-offs. It's more than just a list of pros and cons. You give up this, but then you get this. Throughout this entire series, I'll be showing you what those trade-offs are so that you can decide what's best for you. 
So this video is about picking a shotgun. Now whether you're looking for your first shotgun or looking for your next one, this video will help you make the best decision. And there are plenty of trade-offs to talk about. Now let's start off with a very brief history lesson. There are many predecessors to the modern shotgun dating back as far as the 1500s. We know that the French were shooting flying birds in the early to mid 1600s with flintlock scatter guns. In the 1700s, we see the earliest use of the term shotgun. In 1878, the invention of the hammerless shotgun revolutionized firearms. These double barrel shotguns utilize cartridges, incorporating powder and pellets in a quick loading shot shell. These replace the muzzleloader. With the help of John Browning and other contemporaries, shotguns made massive improvements through the turn of the century. And by 1909, the shotgun takes its modern form with pump and semi-automatic shotguns readily available. The technology from the past 20 years has taken firearms and shooting to levels that those early inventors could never have dreamed of. And today, we're living in the heyday for being a duck hunter and shotgun shooter. So when it comes to choosing the best gun for you, the first place that comes to mind for me is deciding what gauge of shotgun you want to get. Do you want a 12 gauge or 20? or something else. Here's one for you that I bet many of you don't know. Why is a 12 gauge called a 12 gauge? Or a 20 gauge called a 20? Now, I know that most of us definitely understand that it, it's about sizing. I mean, this is a 12 gauge and this is a 20 gauge. A 12 is bigger than the 20. But how do they arrive at the 12 gauge being a 12 gauge? Well, I've got the answer and it's pretty interesting. So the gauge of a shotgun is determined by a lead sphere, a lead ball like this one. It fits inside the barrel end of a shotgun, and then they weigh that ball, and this one happens to be a twelfth of a pound. A twelfth is a 12 gauge. Uh, in this case right here, this is a 28 gauge, so it's a 1 28th of a pound. It would be the same for the 20 gauge being 1 20th, that sort of thing. But what about the 410? The 410 is different. The 410 is the only gauge that's actually measured by the bore size, so it's really not a gauge. It's 0 .410 of an inch. Its equivalent would be a 67.62 gauge, much smaller than a 28 gauge, even though it doesn't seem like it's that much smaller. So what are the most common gauges today? Well, the 12 gauge is by far the most common gauge for waterfowl hunting. Next in popularity would be the 20 gauge, followed by the 28 gauge and then the 410. The least popular are the 10 gauge and the 16 gauge respectively. Without getting into the weeds too much on gauges, uh, the main difference is the larger the gauge, the larger the payload, uh, the smaller the gauge, the smaller the payload, the amount of pellets in a shot shell. Now, the trade-off in all that is the larger the gauge usually is going to mean a larger kick or recoil versus the smaller gauges. We're not going to spend any more time here discussing the differences of all the gauges. There's going to be another video about that down the road. Throughout this video series, we'll mainly be using 12 gauge shotguns and ammo because it's the most common and the most relevant to the largest amount of viewers. Now let me speak for just a moment on some personal experience. I've shot mostly 12 gauges for ducks and geese in my lifetime, and in the last several years I've shot the 20 gauge a lot more than I have my 12 using TSS and bismuth, and I've never felt undergunned. I've also shot a 28 gauge on half a dozen hunts and even a 410 about the same amount of times. Again, using bismuth and at shorter distances using the 410. It was a very adequate combo. So once you've decided which gauge you're gonna go with, now let's talk about which action of gun you're gonna choose. While there are many actions available for shotguns, the most common three are the brake action, the pump, and the autoloader. Let's start with the brake action shotgun. 
A break action can be like this over under or side by side, or even the less common single barrel break action. And then there's the triple barrel. Loading a break action gun involves sliding the break action lever, which breaks the gun open. You can then load the shell or shells into each barrel, then slam the action closed. Now, depending upon the make of the firearm, you can select between which barrel shoots first. Some have a single trigger and some have two. This particular over-under has the safety on the top, excess by the thumb. Many of these guns are quite beautiful and very expensive. These can be fun guns to shoot, but many of them are quite heavy and usually have a lot of felt recoil. I've hunted with them over the years, and for me, it's more of a novelty than a practical hunting gun. I just don't personally like the weight, the kick, and having to be so careful with them. I know that some of you are going to disagree with me, and that's cool. You've decided it's worth the trade-off for you. Pump action. In loading a pump, you take your cartridge and load it into the magazine. Then depress the action release and pump the cartridge or shell into the chamber. After a shell has been shot, you physically pump the action all the way down and then back up. The spent shell is ejected and then a new shell is loaded from the magazine into the chamber. Pump guns are some of the most economical guns to purchase. They can also be some of the most durable and reliable. The pump is a simple, basic shotgun that many feel get the job done just fine. However, the felt recoil and lack of options are a negative to many avid hunters. Like I said earlier, I was mostly happy over the years to be shooting my Remington 870 12 gauge, but after years of guiding and getting beat up with my gun, I decided it was time to move on from a pump to an auto-loading shotgun. The autoloader. An autoloading shotgun really is a semi-automatic firearm, meaning you have to pull the trigger each time you want to fire the gun. So you load the gun in the same manner that you would a pump. However, you load the shell from the magazine by pulling the bolt handle back or by putting the shell directly into the chamber and then depressing the bolt release button. Many semi-automatic shotguns have the least amount of felt recoil. And there are two types of autoloaders, gas operated and inertia driven. And to help me explain the differences between gas and inertia, as well as a bunch of other things throughout the rest of this video, is my buddy Steve Gould. Now Steve is an exhibition shooter and pro for federal ammunition. He's got a couple of fantastic YouTube channels. One with his brother highlighting their trick shooting called Ghoul Brothers. This is the Bro Double Shoot, Swap, and Shoot. Yes. Uh. Oh! Was that it? That was it. And his other channel is called Target Focus Life. Now on that channel, he does a lot of shotgun reviews and that sort of thing, and they are the best shotgun reviews on all of YouTube. So if you want to see a video on a specific shotgun, make sure you check out Target Focus Life. Super excited about you being with me to help me navigate all of the stuff about different shotguns. There is a lot, and it can be a little bit confusing. So I'm glad we're making this video because I think this is going to be very helpful for the folks watching trying to select their either, like you said, their very first shotgun or their next shotgun. Right, so let's start off by talking about gas versus inertia. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Gas guns, in general, have less recoil, less felt recoil anyways, because of the way the gun operates. So what's happening in a gas gun is we got all these hot gases coming down the barrel. Some of it gets diverted into a piston that comes back and helps operate the bolt, right? And that's how your shell ejects. That whole process helps reduce the felt recoil. The Winchester SX4 is one of the lightest shotguns, semi-auto shotguns that I've ever shot. And I think that's sort of been your case too. And so gas guns, less recoil. Now there is a downside to gas guns versus inertia. Generally, they are a little dirtier because they're capturing those hot gases. In fact, I could break this down really quick and we can kind of dive in and see what a gas gun looks like. And this is gonna be a little mystery, I don't know Last time this gun was clean, doesn't look too dirty. No. 
But what's happening is the gas has come down the barrel, come out little ports, and every gas gun can be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But you see this piston, it's full of carbon, mm -hmm. nice right. and dirty. And this is full of carbon on the sleeve. And so you get a lot more carbon in your shotgun when you're operating a gas gun. And some of it will get into the action as well. Um, but very reliable, a lot of these gas guns are through a range of loads and softer shooting. So I love gas guns, but like everything we're going to talk about in this video, there's a trade-off. This dirtiness is a trade-off. More moving pieces. I mean, he's got the piston, the piston sleeve, the spring. It's got more moving pieces to clean, to maintain, and that adds weight. Yeah. Even though the SX4 isn't a very heavy gun. Now, let's contrast that with this gun. This is an inertia-operated gun. It's going to have a lot less pieces, as you'll see in just a minute. But one thing to point out, and I don't think many people think about, is gas versus inertia can have different balance, right? Because gas guns have more up front in the forend here, mm -hmm. that piston, that piston sleeve, the spring, and that can bring a little bit more weight out front. Where I pick up this Benelli Super Black Eagle 3, and I can feel it feels heavier in back. Some people may like that, mm -hmm. some may not. The way I look at it, I actually kind of like a little bit more weight out front. It puts the weight out here. I seem to have smoother swings yeah. when I'm getting on birds, but this feels pretty good in the hands too. And I love to break this gun down because as you'll see here in a second, now check this out. Barrel and forend yeah. off, yeah. bolt out. This is what we're working with here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? This gun is using the inertia of the shot, and there is a spring back in here right. that's helping cycle the gun, but just a few pieces to it, not much to it, easy to clean, easy to maintain, that's one thing to love. If that's a concern for you, fewer moving pieces, then obviously this is a very viable option going this route, but if recoil is a bigger concern, then the gas gun might be more of a viable option. I don't think you should walk up to a shotgun, look at these two shotguns and go, well, this one's inertia, so I'm going with this one. Right. I don't think that's enough of a selling point because this could be inertia. You pick it up, it doesn't fit you well. It recoils like a mule. And there's the ergonomics stink for you. You don't like that. Right. The trigger pulls hard. Right. Could be so many other factors to consider. But I do think just having the foreknowledge that inertia, generally less moving pieces, easier to clean, but generally a little more recoil and gas, you know, the opposite. More pieces, a little dirtier, but lighter shooting. And just having that foreknowledge going in, but pick the guns up and start feeling them. Maybe we should just jump right into the fit of a shotgun and how important that is. So the fit of a shotgun is super, super important because we don't aim a shotgun, right? right. We point. Just like I can point at an object with both eyes open, my focus is out on the target. Now, if we start messing with the eyes, we're gonna mess up everything. And if our eye is not perfectly aligned down the rib of this shotgun, we're not gonna shoot where we're looking. And that's what shotgun shooting is. Shoot where you're looking. Shoot where you're target focused. See how I did that? There you go. <laughs> like so, the problems that people run into, number one, Joel, is they don't shoot on their dominant eye side. Right, And this is all part of gun fit. I know I'm talking a lot about the eyes here, but first we need to figure out what is our dominant eye side. Are we right eye dominant or left eye dominant? And a lot of people think, oh, I'm right-handed, I'm right eye dominant. No, 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 slow down. Let's do a test. Simple, simple test you can do is if you find an object in the distance, and like say we looked at the camera, Joel, and we put our finger under the camera, both eyes open, right? Close your left eye now. What happened to your finger, Joel? It stayed in the same place. Stayed in the same place. Why is that? Because I'm right-eye dominant. Because he's right-eye dominant. Now, what would have happened if he's left-eye dominant and he closed his left eye, his finger would have jumped or appeared to have jumped, right? So that's what happens if I have both eyes open and I close my right eye, it looks like my finger just jumped to the right. Figure out if you're left or right-eye dominant. So my son, for example, he's left-eye dominant. So he's nine right now. He just started shooting shotgun this year. I just have him shooting left-handed. 
And, and people say, well, it's so awkward. No, what's awkward is shooting on your non-dominant eye side and, and having your eyes fight each other. That's awkward. Anyone can learn to shoot left-handed. Now that we know what our dominant eye side is, when we're selecting a shotgun and trying to look for good fit, we want to find our eye looking straight down the rib. So you pull up the shotgun and you mount it and you find your eye is too low. And you're seeing really this part of the receiver is where your eye's seeing. Mm -hmm. Your eye's too low and when your eye's low, you will tend to shoot low. Same goes with if your eye's too high, you will shoot high. And that's affected by, one, how you mount the shotgun. Sometimes you need to fit yourself to the shotgun, but a thing called drop. We got the drop at the comb, which is the distance that it drops from the receiver to the comb and drop at heel. And if there's too much drop, your head can be too low. If there's not enough drop, your head can be too high. A lot of modern shotguns, the semi-autos especially, have spacer kits or shim kits mm -hmm. that you can adjust drop. So that's something to consider. But I always like to go, when I'm picking out a shotgun, find one that's out of the box, close. We can make small adjustments, but I want it close out of the box. And we can dial in things like length of pull. We can dial in cast, which is how your stock is bent left or right, and that's really important whether you're shooting right or left-handed. Length of pull real quickly is the distance from the trigger to the butt end of the shotgun. Now, really quick test for this, whether length of pull is adequate for you or not, is when you mount it up, you look at the distance between the knuckle of your thumb and your nose, and you should have two, two and a half finger widths or so. If the gun's too short, this is a, a gun I bought for my kids. Mm -hmm. It's got a shorter length of pull. I mount this bad boy up. Look where my thumb is. Oh yeah. It's basically touching my nose. Now it doesn't help to have a bigger nose. You know, you might have to increase your length of pull if you got a bigger nose. But what's gonna happen if I shoot this gun too short, this thumb is gonna punch, punch my nose and it doesn't feel good. So what do you do if you have a gun that just doesn't fit you? I think most people that get into duck hunting are starting off with a shotgun that they were given by their father or their granddad yeah. or whatever. Which is a really, yeah. really cool thing, but it might not always fit you well. This is one of my latest additions, but it's an older gun. It's a Winchester Model 12. And so just to talk real briefly about what do we do if I don't really, you could bring this to a, a gunsmith and have them do some customizations. One, I don't want to really mess with this older gun because it's cool that it's in its original form. Uh, and two, I don't want to spend a lot, a lot of money getting a custom fit. Really quick tip. Here's my quick hack for that. So many people will mount a shotgun like this into the shoulder and then face down. Well, guess what? That's not fitting me either. My eye, let's see if I can explain this. The barrel is here. My eye was over here, uh -huh. not a good scenario. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up the shotgun and fit the gun to me, uh -huh. right? I can't make all these customizations to fit it to me, I'm gonna fit myself to the gun. So as I mount, I mount into my cheek first and then back. And my eye is perfectly aligned over the rib, left to right, and up and down. And I know generally if I mount a gun right here, it's gonna be close. Every gun's a little bit different. Might require some different mounts, but if I come up to my face and back, boom, I'm right there. Don't worry about necessarily how it sits on your shoulder. If you have to fit to yourself to the gun, that's the way to do it. Well, I've been looking at all these guns and you brought a few to add to the mix. Right. But I can't take my eyes off this one. This gun has three barrels. Yep. So tell me about it. So that's a triple barrel uh, Charles Daly. Okay. It's a 28 gauge. Wow. Have you ever shot a triple barrel 28 gauge before? <laughs> Can't say I have. You know what? I'd like to see you pull a trick shot with that gun upside down over your head, three clays. Like this. Like that. Throw three clays, shoot over the head. Yep. Can you do uh, it? I think I can pull that off. I'd like to see. It'll be interesting. Okay. Let's do it. But we should probably finish the video first. We'll do this at the end. Let's do it at the All end. All right. Okay, Steve, so we've talked about the fit of the shotgun. How about let's talk about feel, features and ergonomics, how a gun feels in our hands. 
Yeah. Many semi-autos offer oversized controls like a bigger bolt handle, larger safety, and oversized bolt release. What's your opinion on that? So, I love it. Okay. I honestly love it. Those are three things that I really like to see in a shotgun because they're less things for me to go wrong in the field. Controls are big for me. But outside of that, how does it feel in the hands? And more than that is how does it feel in the hands as you come up and mount? You know, the, the feel of a shotgun is very important to me. Some guns have large pistol grips here and they're just kind of clunky. I don't prefer that. You may, and that's fine. There's no right or wrong in that. But looking at the ergonomics of a shotgun, the grip is important. I love features like this, Joel. It has the rubber over molding. Mm -hmm. And so you hold this gun in your hands. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. picture being out in the duck blind with that. That, it, it that gun ain't going good. nowhere. It does feel good. No doubt. And so I love little features like that when it comes to ergonomics. And when you're in the store looking for a gun, pick them up and just start mounting them. Find a spot on the wall, focus on that spot, close your eyes, and see if you're right on it. And that's going to give you a good indication of how well the gun fits you right out of the box. I can tell you when I pick up a gun that feels good in the hands, that is balanced well, that has a nice trigger, and that fits me, and I get out and start shooting that gun, one, it's more enjoyable to shoot, and two, I hit more birds, you know? And that makes the whole experience better for me. For many, the bottom line is price. Now, even though we didn't start the video off by discussing budget, it really is very important. It helps us to know kind of where to start and looking for a gun. In general terms, if you have a budget of $500 and down, your best bet is to go for a pump gun. And you can get into an auto loader at just above that price point with some nice guns in the seven to $800 range. Now for those of you who are interested in my gun choice, the SX4 from Winchester, it's roughly an $800 to $1,000 gun, depending upon which model you choose. Now, I've enjoyed my 12 gauge so much that I also decided to buy the SX4 20 gauge. Now, I've shot it a bunch as well. As we've discussed with Steve, the extra features on shotguns that add to the shooting experience can be really nice, but they also add to the price as well. For example, a Beretta A400 Extreme Plus can cost between $1,700 and $2,000, depending upon which model you choose. There's certainly other gun choices at higher and lower costs, and knowing your budget and your needs will help you to narrow down which shotgun is best for you? As we've learned today, finding the gun that fits you and that feels right is very important. It means everything in helping you to be effective at hitting your target and ethically harvesting the game you're after. All right, before we see if Steve can make that trick shot with the triple barrel 28 gauge, I need to know if you have any questions about ammunition and choke tubes. We're in the final stages of production of this series, and I don't want to leave anything out. All right, now let's see if Steve can make that shot. Joel, if you could please hold your applause to the end, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Steve is a professional exhibition shooter, and he has years of training and practice. Please do not attempt trick shooting without the proper training in a controlled environment. And remember, always practice safety whenever you're shooting a firearm. This short barrel is throwing me for a loop, man. It's part of what we talked about, though. Change the barrel, you change your sight picture, especially when you're shooting over the head. You got this, Steve. Okay. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling good. I'm warming up. The barrel's warming up. We just had to get things heated up a little bit. There's three. Gun over the head. Oh man, unbelievable. Sweet. Hey, so a point that we talked about in the video, right? Yep, Practical yep. application of that. I picked up a gun I've never shot before. It's shorter than barrels, shorter barrel than I'm used to. Mm -hmm. I had to think a lot. And so normally when I do trick shots, I've had the repetition, I've had the practice, 
I just have to execute. I have to see the clays be dialed in, but I'm throwing these clays and I'm checking back on my barrel and how are things lining up? And so that's a challenge. And that's just another testament to get your gun out, put in the repetitions. I don't care if it's dry fire practice or actual shooting clays or whatever you're doing, make that stuff second nature so you can shut it off, focus on your target, pull that trigger. I'm like blown away. I mean, it's not like we went out here and you shot like three or four boxes of shells to do that. I mean, you shot it a couple of times. And yeah, you got it. picked it up. That's amazing. Right on. Your turn? No. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you check out the next video in this series. And special thanks to my buddy Steve Gould of Target Focus Life. I'm Joel Strickland. God bless, and I'll see you on the next video.